Good morning, Grace Community Church. If you're able, I'm going to invite you to stand as we worship Jesus this morning. Let's give him our best praise today.
dream that he gave his only son. He might be forgiven, death has been overcome.
is good all the time and all of us here that are believers in Jesus there is something that we can testify about that God has been good to us even when we haven't been faithful to him every single day of our lives and all of our thoughts and actions and deeds and words he still remains faithful and Lord we just praise you we thank you God that you're good all the time 
even when we don't see that goodness in our lives, when we're going through difficult times, hard times, God, the scripture says that God causes all things to work together for his glory and for our good. And so, Lord Jesus, would you give us eyes to see and hearts to understand your wisdom and your plan that is good for our lives. We declare that you are good. We give you praise today. In Jesus' name, amen. Because I know you live, I put my faith in this, that you hear my call. Lord, you'll hear me calling, because I know you live, I set my heart on this, you won't let me fall, when all this is for.
Jews that are located in the front, the sides, and the back of this room. Just as we sang this song, that I know that you are for me, you came to save me, you will never let me go, and in my heart I'll always know. When I think about that, those lyrics, I think about my own testimony. And I found Jesus, I met Jesus when I was in 10th grade. But as a teenager, my life was filled with anger, lust, disobedience, to parents and being exposed to th things I shouldn't be watching and looking at at a very young age in my teens I was hooked into lust and during this one prayer meeting in India where I'm from this friend of mine um, he's around 12 years old and he walks up to me and he's a friend of my parents and then he walks up to me towards the end of the meeting and I was feeling worthless because I had just watched something I shouldn't have watched before going into this prayer meeting that my parents dragged me into. And towards the end of this meeting, he walks up to me and later I realized that he had a prophetic word, but he begins to talk to me and he says, hey Aaron, how are you doing? And then after that, he basically tells me all of my sins to the detail. And that's not a typical teenager, 10th grader sins that you can look up on the internet and then you tell him back. No, those were very detailed things, as if he was in my room and he was watching me do those things. And at the end of telling me all of my sins, he tells me, Aaron, you're looking for temporary satisfaction. Those things only lead you. You're actually looking for eternal satisfaction or satisfaction that will last for a very, very long time. But the things that you're doing only gives you temporary satisfaction, doesn't it? And I said, yes, how did you know? And he didn't answer that question because, of course, you know, he knew the answer. And so he was... Uh, telling me this and then he said Jesus has life for you Jesus has ultimate satisfaction he's the source of all happiness all rest all peace all joy but none of these things that you're doing can ever help you get or help you satisfy you know those deepest needs in your life and so basically after that he tells me I'm not going to blackmail you I'm not going to tell your parents all your sins but I'm going to tell you this, Jesus has life for you today, Aaron. And if you give your life to him, everything will change. I'm not saying it will change all at once in the moment, but it will begin to change and that was true. And because of that freedom that he gave me today, I'm leading worship here at Grace, I'm working here at Grace. This is my testimony. And so when I think about those lyrics, when I think about that song, it resonates very deeply with me. Does that, that resonate with you and your testimony? And so this, this is the invitation that I want to give you, church. If you're a believer, remember your testimony. Remember why we take communion. It's because of Jesus. Remember why we even live the life that we live. We're dead to sin, alive in Christ Jesus, what the Bible says. And while we are yet sinners, Christ died for us. And so this is my testimony. What is your testimony? Think about that. And if you are an unbeliever, I want to extend that invitation to you that Jesus has life for you. He says that I come so that you may have life and have more abundantly. And he's, he's extending that life towards you. Are you satisfied with the things that you're doing in your own life? Are they bringing you eternal satisfaction? Are they only satisfying your needs for a little bit? And then you have to run back to those things again and again and again. And it only keeps you wanting more and more and more. See, Jesus has life. And if you're in this room this morning, God wants you here. God wants you to know that he loves you and that he has life for you. So Jesus has come to fulfill the deepest needs of your life. Church, let's all stand as we remember the body of Jesus that was broken for us, the blood that was shed for us, for you, and for me. Lord Jesus, we praise you. We thank you, God, for the way you saved me. And you still are saving me from my sins and my 
shortcomings and my weaknesses. God, I praise your name. And we praise your name as your, as your body this morning, God. Would you help us walk worthy of the calling that we have received from you? And this calling is to be your sons and your daughters. Shine the light of Christ wherever we go this week. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Let's eat and drink together.
you're holy and we give you our praise. We give you our minds, we give you our heart. Would you teach us how to love you with all of our heart, all of our mind, our soul, our strength, God, this week. You're holy. Would you teach us how to walk worthy of you, holy of the calling that we have received from you this week. In Jesus' name and the church says amen. Amen. You can be seated at church. So at this time, we want to dismiss those that are serving in Adventure Land Middle School Discover class. If you're teaching, helping, or serving in any way, you may be dismissed at this moment. And parents, we encourage you that you can, um, you're welcome to keep your kids with you as long as they don't become a distraction. But if they do, then we encourage you to take them to their Adventure Land class today. Let's pray. Jesus, would you touch the hearts and minds of every single student, every single teacher, and we ask, God, that your name will be exalted in every classroom today. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, Grace Dam, it's Patrice McLaughlin with Embrace Grace, and I'm excited to update you guys on how our semester went. In August, we had an expectancy of five moms joining us, and our first night, we had one brave mom show up. As the weeks passed by, we filled our class to capacity with seven brave moms who chose life and said yes to allowing the Lord um, to come alongside as they entered into this journey as they prepared for motherhood. Each of the 11 ministry weeks, uh, we invite these ladies in and we have dinner together um, and we invite them to invite Jesus into some of the most intimate places of brokenness and um, hurt and despair and loneliness and heal the scars that they may carry so that they can walk freely into motherhood. One Bloom said yes to the call of the Lord knocking on the door of her heart and she accepted salvation. We also had another bloom who rededicated her life to the Lord and was baptized, her and her unborn baby. We experienced so much of his love and his mercy throughout this ministry. And I just wanted to thank you, Grace family, for your love and your support of this ministry through your meals and through opening even your homes um, to host us and also with that grand gesture of a beautiful baby shower that we were able to throw through your generosity of shopping and bringing gifts and also with your presence of showing up and hugging and loving on these beautiful ladies. Praise God. Today is a Sanctity of Life Sunday. It's a Sunday in which thousands of churches across this country are reminding all of their people that all of human life is sacred because all of human life has been made in the from conception all the way to the last breath. And one of the ways that, well, several of the ways that we really focus on the sanctity of human life, and you probably got one of these cards when you came in. I hope you did. Some of our ministries just heard about Embrace Grace, which is serving uh, young single moms who've chosen to keep their baby. We also have Embrace Life Ministry, helping single moms navigate through motherhood. Then we have Embrace Legacy, which is assisting single dads to become fathers they desire to be, and then Foster Adopt, supporting those in our church who are pursuing foster and adoption. And so this is just some of the ways that we really want to be positively involved in helping these women keep their babies and then make the first steps into motherhood. Now, also, hopefully you got one of these on the way in. If you didn't, please grab one on the way out. It's a baby bottle. But what we do every year is we take time to take these home for a few weeks. We put as much coins in there and you stick, you know, just go ahead and stuff some, some bills in there as well and bring it back on February 11th. And this helps fund those ministries. So grab one of these baby bottles. And also on this Sanctity Life Sunday, we're going to have a time of dedication of children. And I'm going to go ahead and tell you who's coming up first service, and then I'll tell you a little bit about it as they make their way up here. Well, first service, we have 
Jose and Cheyenne, Randia Aramboni are bringing Zeke. So make your way on up here. And also we have Dolores and CJ and Kata are bringing Noah, Peace, and Sovereign. So if you guys will go ahead and come up to the front. So there you go. Forgot your baby. You can do second service? Oh, okay, switch to second service. Oh. Okay, well, we got those flipped here on my paper. So anyway, you now you know what happens second service. Okay, right now we have this service. We have Blake and Alex Bostick are bringing Brighton, so please make your way on up here. And Kevin and Christina Bach are bringing Caleb Samuel. And Tracy Randerman is bringing Carly. And Kendall and Libby uh, Lyon are bringing Kendall Bryan. So please make your way on up. And by the way, if you're family with any of these families, come on up with them and gather around them. And go ahead and just step, maybe we'll step up a little bit as you come up here so, so others can gather around you and, and pray for you. And also, let's all stand. And if others of you who know these families would like to pray for them and these children, go ahead and make your way on up and gather around them. Again, this does not make the child a Christian. Each person must grow up, come to the realization of their sin and the need for a Savior, and make that decision to turn to Jesus through repentance and faith. But what this does, this is a time for parents to dedicate their children to the Lord, realize that this child is on loan from the Lord, doesn't really belong to them, is on lease to them, and they are dedicating themselves to raise these children in the ways of the Lord, and they're asking us for our support, our prayers, and our help to do that. So those of you that are up front here, go ahead and lay hands on the families, and those of you out here, please extend your hands as we pray for these families. Father, we thank you for these gifts that you've given of these families here. We thank you, Lord. We're grateful. And we pray right now through the laying out of hands, a special anointing on these families to raise these children in your ways, O oh Lord. Raise these children in your ways in every way. We pray, Lord, that your hand will be upon each of these children, Lord. We pray, Lord, that for Brighton and Caleb Samuel and Carly and Kendall Bryan, we ask you, Lord, would you raise these children up to be mighty in you? Also, we pray for your protection on them. We pray you'd cause every demonic scheme against them to fail in Jesus' name. We pray for mighty warriors, Lord. We pray that this would be this generation that takes the baton across the finish line. And so we ask you all this in the mighty name of Jesus. And we all say together, amen. 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 Give them a hand, guys. Okay, as they're making their way back to their seats, I want to invite Nick Norzad to come on up here. Nick and Aziza, come on up here too. Many of you know our, our ministry that we have in Central Asia that uh, really has been a powerful ministry. And Nick's heading back over for a couple months. And so Nick, come up here front. Aziza, come up here. And we're going to gather around them and pray before we take a break for greeting. But again, some of you come up and gather around them as well. This is such an important ministry. So much has happened there in a very desperate part of the world. And so let's pray again. Father, we do thank you for this ministry. We ask for your anointing powerfully on Nick as he goes. And your Holy Spirit, we pray, Lord, that you would just enable things to be imparted quickly, Lord, in this part of Central Asia. We pray, Lord, that there would be something released, Lord, through this ministry that goes way beyond the ministry. Lord, it impacts this whole area of the world. We're asking you to protect them. Lord, we pray for your hand, Lord, upon Aziza, Lord, as, she, as, as Nick's gone. And we ask you, oh Lord, for uh, just your provision in every way. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. And also we pray for one another, Lord. We just pray for the one on our right and left. We ask, Lord, for your blessing. We ask for, Lord, your anointing on them. And we ask that you would use us everywhere we go, Lord, our neighborhoods and our places of work. And use us to really shine the light in the dark places of the world in Jesus' name. Amen. Go ahead and greet one another, would you please? Good morning, everyone. I'm Don Beecham, one of the pastors here at Grace. And we're so glad that you've joined us online today. 
And I know that for many of you, there's good reasons why you're not here uh, worshiping with us in the sanctuary, but we just want you to know that we really miss you. If it's been a while since you've been able to join us in person, I hope you can return soon. I know you'll benefit from being a part of community and corporate worship and will benefit greatly just from having you here. Well, our fellowship time is almost over here in the worship center. So get ready for some announcements about upcoming activities at Grace and then have your Bibles and a notebook handy as we prepare for today's message. Thanks for joining. Whether you're in service or online, we're so glad you're joining us today. A lot of great things are happening at Grace. Here are a few. Do you want to learn more about Grace and become a member? You are invited to Discovering Grace, a two-part class led by Pastor Gary, followed by a six-week small group. Our class starts today, and part two will be Sunday, January 28th from 12.30 to 2 p.m. Scan the QR code to register and learn more at gracearlington.com slash discoveringgrace. This year, for our season of giving, we took on four projects that sought to bless four ministries within and outside of our church. Hagar's Heart, an organization that aids and blesses domestic violence survivors. Mission Arlington, the local organization that assists people with their physical, intellectual, emotional, and spiritual needs the Green Oaks Food Bank, providing food to the needy families in our area, and of course, our Mexico Outreach Ministry that aims to build relationships with churches in Mexico by serving them in a practical way. In all, we collected 669 items for Hagar's Heart, 922 food items for the Green Oaks Food Bank, 117 toys for Mission Arlington, and with some additional help, we sent 1,875 toys to Mexico this year. Thank you for the part you played in making these projects happen and for your generosity this Christmas season. And if this is your first time at Grace, why don't you come up to the welcome area after service and we'll give you a gift. There are so many ways you can serve or find community here. Head to Connection Corner where our team would love to help you get connected. If you would like to give today, there are boxes around the room, or you can give online at gracearlington.com slash give, or text Grace Arlington and the amount to 73256. For everyone who came today, we put a card in the seat pocket in front of you. It has a place for prayer requests and praises, as well as a QR code that you can scan with your phone to get quick access to things like the sermon notes for today. We're so glad you've joined us today. Welcome to Grace. Welcome to Grace. We are glad you've joined us. And if you hadn't yet taken the Discovering Grace uh, membership uh, commitment class, I urge you to take it today. Come today, go across the, the parking lot to the Life Center down the end of the hallway, and you'll find us there. Lunch is provided, 12.30 to 2. You're going to be so glad you took the class. And the class is also followed up by a small group that Tracy and I lead. We get to know you, you get to know us. We want to help you get connected, help you discover your ministry because you have a calling in your life, and we want you to do well with that. So I urge you, if you haven't taken it, please come today. Let's pray one more time. Let's look at the Word together. Father, we ask for the, <clears throat> the teaching ministry of the Holy Spirit, and we pray, Lord, that that work that you want to do in each of us today would happen. Even now, we want to yield ourselves to that. We want to posture ourselves to receive from you. We ask you to do that in Jesus' name. Amen. So there was this guy, he was a thief, and he broke into this house, and as he's going through the house looking for valuables to steal, he notices a parrot cage. As he gets close to the parrot cage, the parrot squawks, Jesus is watching you, Jesus is watching you. So he looked a little closer at the cage and actually had a little bit of a nameplate on it that said, John the Baptist. 
And so this thief just says out loud, what kind of religious nut names their parrot John the Baptist? And the parrot said, the same kind that names their pit bull Jesus. <laughs> well, this morning we want to talk about the real John the Baptist and the real Jesus, who is in fact watching you and me, all of us. We started this series last week entitled God's Grand Story, the New Testament. We spent most of 2023 doing God's Grand Story, the Old Testament. Most of 2024, we'll focus on God's Grand Story, the New Testament, really the whole story. We're trying to divide this up in, in ways that we can really see the flow of both the Old Testament and the New Testament. <clears throat> in the New Testament, the flow is very simple. Jesus comes, then Jesus ministers, then Jesus dies and lives. Then the church begins, and then we have the letters from the Apostle Paul to churches. Then we have general letters or general epistles by some other authors, and then we have the book of Revelation. So seven uh, simple you know, ways to divide the New Testament and remember it. And we're going to continue in that first. And we want to go ahead and see what happens after that genealogy. Well, the next thing that comes in the story in the New Testament is the introduction and the ministry of the forerunner of Christ, and that is John the Baptist. And the first thing, we are, the first thing that happens is we're introduced to him by a supernatural birth. Remember in the story that Elizabeth, who would be his mother, was old, very old, and barren. And she had not been able to conceive her entire life, and then God supernaturally enables her, her and Zacharias, to conceive. Let's read that. Luke chapter 1, verse 7 says, But they, Zacharias and Elizabeth, had no child, because Elizabeth was barren, and they were both advanced in years. So God supernaturally enables them to conceive. And then there is a visitation of an angel to Zacharias. And the angel prophesies about what this child will, will, will be like and what he will do. Let's just jump to that. Luke 1.15. This is said of John the Baptist. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He will drink no wine or liquor and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit while yet in his mother's womb. And he'll turn many of the sons back to the Lord their God. It is he who will go as a forerunner before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of fathers back to their children and the disobedient to the attitude of the righteous so as to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. So that's his ministry. Now I want you to notice something that happens while Elizabeth is pregnant with John the Baptist. If you remember the story, Mary, the angel Gabriel has visited Mary who will be the mother of Jesus. And after this visitation where Mary realizes she's going to conceive supernaturally, give birth to the savior of the world, she goes to see her, her much older aunt, Elizabeth. And as she gets to Elizabeth, something happens that I want you to notice. Luke chapter 1, verse 41. <clears throat> when Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. And she cried out with a loud voice. So now she's prophesying. Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. The prophecy continues to verse 44. For behold, when the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby leaped in my womb for joy. Now, before we go further in this story, I want to point out to you today that on this Sanctity of Life Sunday, that what's in the womb of Elizabeth, the Word of God calls a baby. You know, there's debate sometimes among Christians, which just confuses me, whether or not there is a, it's just a mass of tissue 
or that's a baby. But here we have very clearly in this passage that the word of God refers to what is in her womb to be a baby. And that means that it should be treated like a baby, protected like a baby, cared for like a baby. And when someone says that they are pro-choice, we need to realize what they're saying is they're saying a woman should have the right to do what? To kill her baby. And that's obviously wrong and evil. So very simply, you know, we need to understand if we are going to be those who believe the Bible is the word of God and Jesus, the only one who's ever risen from the dead, said the Old Testament is the word of God and promised the New Testament would be the word of God by the power of the Holy Spirit through the apostles. So if you say you believe in Jesus, then you must believe the Bible to be true, the word of God. And the Bible says that which is in the womb of a pregnant mother is a baby. We need to be consistent in what we believe. So John the Baptist, <clears throat> back to the story, comes on the scene just as the angel prophesied. And sure enough, he is great. In fact, according to Jesus, there has never been anyone born of a woman up to this point in history as great as John the Baptist. Let's look at that. Matthew 11, verse 11. Jesus says this, Truly I say to you, among those born of women, there has not arisen anyone greater than John the Baptist. Have you ever wondered why he was the greatest up to that point in history, the greatest? What made him great? Do you know what made John the Baptist Great. Well, let's look here at what's said in the Word to see if we can determine what makes him great so we can also be those who can follow his model in that same quality. John chapter 1, verse 6 through 8, says this. There came a man sent from God whose name was John. He came for a witness that he might bear witness of the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came that he might bear witness of the light. Let's jump down to verse 19. And this is the witness of John. <clears throat> when the Jews sent to him priests, <coughs> excuse me, priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who are you? He confessed and did not deny, and he confessed, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, What then? Are you Elijah? He said, I'm not. Are you the prophet? He answered, no. They said to him, then, who are you so that we may give an answer to those who sent us? What do you say about yourself? He said, I am a voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as Isaiah the prophet said. Now, they had been sent from the Pharisees, these Jewish religious leaders. And they asked him, and said to him, why then are you baptizing? If you're not the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet. John answered him, saying, I baptize in water, but among you stands one whom you do not know. It is he who comes after me, the thong of whose sandal I'm not worthy to untie. These things took place in Bethany beyond the Jordan, <clears throat> where John was baptized. So John the Baptist, let's just walk through this. He's asked a series of questions. I, mean, I can imagine the media today, how frustrating it would be to do this interview. Because they can't get the answer from him. They keep asking him questions. That's just, again, John 1, 20. And he confessed and did not deny. He confessed, I'm not the Christ. And are you Elijah? No, I'm not. Are you the prophet? No, I'm not. He kept telling them who he wasn't. But he never told them who he was. Are you the Messiah? By the way, he, he actually had some credibility with this question because a lot of people thought he was the Messiah. I mean, he's one, the one person who probably could have said yes and a lot of people would have believed it up to this point, but he said no. Are you Elijah? Remember Malachi chapter 3 and 4, Isaiah chapter 4, you speak of Elijah coming before Messiah. And Jesus actually points out in Matthew 17, verse 10 through 13, that John was Elijah, only they were not willing to accept it. In fact, John chapter 1, verse 11, he points out that they weren't willing to accept who he was either. Neither were they willing to accept who John was. 
Then they ask the question, are you the prophet? They're talking about Deuteronomy 18, talks about the prophet. But the apostle Peter tells us in Acts chapter 3, verse 22, that this prophet spoken of in Deuteronomy 18 is actually Jesus. But again, he says no. So then they say, well, who are you? Now, earlier in the passage we just read, it said that he was not the light, but he came to bear witness of the light. I just want to stop and pause for that for a second. Because it's interesting to me that John never even told them his name. Because it didn't matter. It didn't matter that they knew who he was because it wasn't about him. It was all about Jesus. He knew he was not the light. He was just pointing to the light. And I think we have a, quite a problem in at least American Christianity because there's such a buzz of, about certain pastors that, you know, they are the ones that are the light. They want to be famous. There's certain churches that, well, they got it going on. They're the light. You know what the truth is? The truth is I'm not the light and you're not the light. Grace Community Church isn't the light. Village Church and Gateway Church and any church is not the light. Jesus is the light. All we are is those pointing to the light, pointing to him. Back in 1996, we uh, signed a covenant with 100 Christian leaders in Arlington. Uh, four points. And the first point, I just mentioned the first point, was simply this. We commit and covenant as leaders of, of, of the church and Jesus, of Jesus Christ in, in Arlington, we commit in covenant to make Jesus famous in our cities. Not another church, not another pastor. And now, the, again, this, the, the, the uh, group has changed in leadership here in the city and, uh, and, and it's been re-signed. That we don't, we don't, well, our goal is not to become the famous church of Arlington. Our goal is that Jesus is the famous one in Arlington. All we are is simply witnesses to the light pointing to Jesus. That's all. It's all about him. It's not about us. Well, who are you, John? John chapter 1, verse 23 said, I am a voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as Isaiah the prophet said. He doesn't give his name. He says, I'm just a voice. I'm the implication, again, being it doesn't matter who I am. It's not about me. Okay, then they say this, then why are you baptizing? Now the question should have been, if you're preparing the way of the Lord, then where is he so we can honor and worship him? That should have been their question. Instead, their question is, well then, if you're not any of those three, the Christ, Elijah, or the prophet, then why are you baptizing? In other words, give us your credentials. And John could have said this, but he didn't. He could have said, don't you know I'm a Levite? I was born the son of a priest. I've been in the wilderness 30 years to prepare for what I'm doing right now. I've been anointed by God. I was filled with the Holy Spirit in my mother's womb. I'm a prophet of God. He could have said all that, but he doesn't say any of that. He told again, takes the focus off himself because it's not about him. All I do is baptize in water. The implication was Kind of, kind of big deal. It's just, it's a religious act. It's a preparatory act. But there is one in your midst that I'm not worthy to get down on my knees and unlatch his sandals. And by the way, a disciple in the first century would do almost, er, er, could do almost anything and everything for a teacher, but the one thing the teacher could not ask him to do is stoop so low as to unlatch his sandals. But John says, I'm not even worthy to do that. But this one. See, he knew Christ was the light. He didn't try to get in the limelight with him. He knew he's simply a voice, a witness to the light that others would come to him. And that's all we are. We are lights. You know, we're just, we're, we're voices in the wilderness. It's not about any of us. It's all about Jesus. It's all about pointing people to him. And that is what made John the Baptist great. It was his humility. And remember again, humility isn't thinking less of yourself. Humility is thinking of yourself less. John the Baptist wasn't thinking of himself at all. That's what made him great.
the greatest. Well, let's just read on to see what happens with John the Baptist at work. John 1.35. And then again the next day, John's standing with two of his disciples. And he looked upon Jesus as he walked and said, Behold the Lamb of God. Now, G John's disciples had heard, had heard John say this the day before. So let's back up to John 1.29. The next day he saw Jesus coming to him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And his disciples heard him say that. Let me read the whole account. Now, John 1.35, again, the next day John was standing with two of his disciples, and he looked upon Jesus as he walked and said, Behold, the Lamb of God. And the two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. And that's exactly what John wanted to see happen. John never told them to follow him. He just told them he's the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And that's all they needed to hear to know that he's the one to follow. Now, in order to be the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, you can't just be a man. As a, another man, a sinner, cannot take away the sins of the world. So, so who is this one who takes away the sin of the world? Well, John 1.30, John the Baptist explains more. This is he on behalf of whom I said, after me comes a man who is a higher rank than I, for he existed before me. Well, actually, the incarnation happened after John was already in the womb of Elizabeth. So how did Jesus exist before him? Because... He is the Son of God, the eternal Son of God. He is the God-man. That's, that's why he can be the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, because he is both God and man. You know, every serious believer in the Old Testament times understood really that the blood of animals and the sacrificial systems could not really take away sins. And... They, all, they knew that all the sacrificial system was looking forward one day to the sacrifice that would take away sins. And John the Baptist sees Jesus and says, there's a Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. This is the one who does it. The Apostle Peter just says it this way. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18. He says, you were ransomed from your futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver and gold, but with this precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb, without blemish or spot. So how could Jesus be without sin? If he is, he's a human, how could he be without sin? Because he wasn't born the normal, ordinary way. Everyone who's born the ordinary way, between with a man and a woman, and they're born, they are born with a sin nature. Just remind you, Romans chapter 5, verse 12. Apostle Paul writes, Just as sin came into the world through one man, that's through Adam, and death through sin, so death spread to all men, because all sin. So the sin nature was passed down to us seminally through, through the man. And every person born in the ordinary way is born a sinner. And a sinner cannot take away the sins of sinners. So how could Jesus do it? Because Jesus wasn't born the ordinary way. He was not born of two humans. He was born a God-man through, through a human mother, Mary, but God supernaturally caused her to conceive. And again, this is part of the Christmas story you're aware of. Let me read it again. Luke 1, 30 through 35. The angel said to young Mary, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son. And you shall call his name Jesus. He'll be great. We call the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he'll reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his, of, of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, how will this be since I'm a virgin? The angel answered her, listen to this, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore the child will be born, will be born, we call holy, the Son of God. So Jesus is born without sin, no original sin, he's holy. In fact, he, he, he lives his whole life without sin. That's why John could say uh, in John 8, 46, which one of you, Jesus says, which one of you convicts me of sin? Well, nobody could because he hadn't sinned. 
1 Peter 2.22, he committed no sin, neither was, in, was deceit found in his mouth. So that is why he could be the one who bears the sins of the world, the sinless one, the God-man. That's why John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Now just for a second, I want you to think that's two shocking things he says in that one statement to the ears of a Jewish person at that time. When John says, This is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, that's two shocking points here. Point number one is that the Lamb of God, the Messiah, the God-man, would die. And he would die a death like a lamb being slaughtered. That was, that was something that was not in their understanding. They had not put that together in the Old Testament. The second thing is that his death would benefit the whole world, not just the Jewish people. It, it would be... I mean, the God-man was a Jewish Messiah, for sure, but the death, his death would take away the sins of the world, not just the sins of Israel, for whosoever believes. Now, the connection between verse 36 and 37 means that the reason that John the Baptist's disciples left John to follow Jesus is because they realized he's the one. He is the Lamb of God who takes the sin of the world. And I want you to get this point. The perfect match... For sinners is the one who takes away sins. This is the perfect match. John 1, 36, and he looked upon Jesus, to behold the Lamb of God, and the two disciples heard him speak, and they followed him. So John the Baptist is, a, is like what he came to do. He's the forerunner, and now he is the matchmaker. I want us to see this. He is so glad to see his disciples run after Jesus. Why? Because Jesus is the perfect match for sinners. He is the one who takes away sin. The perfect match. When I was in high school, we had a, in a public school, we had for a required, you know, a meeting in, in the gymnasium for the entire student body, we had a weightlifter come. And he, after, after he lifted weights and impressed us all, he shared the gospel. That's the first time I, I felt the wooing of the Holy Spirit hearing the gospel. And he's in, right there in a public school. But then there was two young men named Dwayne and Dave, both in high school, that were really walking with, with Jesus in, in ways that I'd never seen before. And I felt the draw. And, and they weren't trying to persuade me, but they were, there was a matchmaking going on by just watching their relationship with Jesus. Then I got to college, and two distance runners on our track team kept talking to me and praying for me and talking about their relationship with Jesus. And again, they weren't so much trying to persuade me as they were like matchmakers. Because the, the perfect match for me as sinner was the sin, one who forgives sin. And they just kept, I kept seeing their relationship with him. Well, back to the story. John 1, I want you to see this. The next day, he purposed to go forth into Galilee and he found Philip. And Jesus said to him, follow me. Now, Philip was from Bethsaida and of the city of Andrew and Peter. And Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him, of whom Moses and the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. So now I want you to see we've got, so Philip encounters Jesus. What does he do? He, it, Jesus is the perfect match for Philip. What does he do? He goes and finds Nathanael because he knows the perfect match for Nathanael is Jesus. So Philip becomes a matchmaker. And then, of course, Nathanael becomes, he's going to become a matchmaker. You know, and I mentioned back in track in college, I had a chance to lead some guys to Christ after I came to Christ as a college student. And one of those uh, young men ended up becoming a youth pastor. And I didn't see him for about 10 years. He showed up in Arlington. He found me, tracked me down, and began to tell me all the God had done in his life. And he had led over 100 teenagers to Christ. And I thought, so now he's a matchmaker. Because Jesus is a perfect match, the one who forgives sins for those who are sinners. He is the perfect match. And I, just, let me, I just want to jump to this, guys. Jesus is the perfect match for your unsaved family. He's a perfect match for your unsaved friends. He's the perfect match for your for unsaved classmates. He's a perfect match for unsaved neighbors. The one who forgives sins is the perfect match for those who are sinners. And our role is that of a matchmaker. Not so much a persuader. I want you to think about that for a moment, that we have a chance to be matchmakers. And I just encourage you to let the people that you want to see come to Christ, let them see your relationship with Jesus. Let them see that. 
Focus more on being a matchmaker than a persuader. Because it's interesting, every time I get on an airplane, I get, I, I get entertained by this, I'll see the stewardess giving the same old safety you know, tips before the plane takes off, and I look around and nobody's listening. And nobody's looking at her or him, nobody, on the whole plane. What would it take to get them to listen? You know what it would take? If that plane at 30,000 feet started to have mechanical difficulties and started to take a nosedive, and then the story starts to say things, everybody's listening, right? Because they realize we need to hear this. This is important. The reason they don't listen usually is because they think, I've heard it all before. Plus, I don't really think anything's going to happen. Well, the same thing is true of unsaved loved ones. They think they've heard it all. And they, all, they really don't think anything's going to happen. But God knows how to get people's attention. God knows how to so work circumstances and situations where people realize they need him. And our, our role ought to be to be ready to be that matchmaker when God gets them ready to listen. And he'll do it. And that's how I want to close our time in prayer because we all have people on our minds that we want to see come to Christ. And sometimes we feel like, what can I do? How can I persuade them? How can I do this? How can I handle, you know, get them to pay attention? All this. God will get their attention. Let's be prepared to be matchmakers when he does. But I want us to pray for God to get their attention. And I want to pray for us that we'll be ready to be those who just share our relationship with Jesus that we have to them when they're ready to hear. Our role is much more matchmakers than persuaders. God does the persuading part. So let's stand for, let's just stand as we close. And I just want you to close your eyes. I want you to think of a person right now, that a loved one, someone you know that doesn't know Christ. I want you to have their face in your mind's eye right now. And Father, you, you're seeing all these faces right now, all these people. And we're asking you, Lord, to so work now in their lives that they'll know they need you. And Lord, we, we know that sometimes that, that could be a painful thing. Sometimes pain is the only thing people listen to. But we're asking, Lord, because we know a much greater pain is awaiting them if they don't know you. So we're asking, Lord, would you enter in to their lives and their situations, their circumstances, those people right now on our minds that we're placing before you. Would you so work, Lord, to get their attention? And then we pray, Lord, would you anoint us to be matchmakers? Would you empower us by your spirit to be those who can really point people to you? The perfect match, the one who takes away the sins of the world. So, Lord, as you, as you make the need known for them, would you also enable us to communicate simply and clearly what it is to walk with you as we share our relationship with you to them? We lift them up, Lord, and we ask you to so work in their lives. Pray this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Now, before you are dismissed, I just encourage you, if you're new here, my wife, Tracy, and I would love to meet you in this welcome area. We have Connection Corner. Staff will answer questions. And I do believe that the Lord wants to do some healing today. So if you have a, a healing need, physical healing, emotional healing, come up to the front and let some leaders lay hands on you and pray for you. God bless you. You're dismissed.